Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Oxford Civic Society talk. Uh, this evening, the topic is the future of personal mobility. And I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Alan Hutchinson, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, School of Engineering, Computing and Maths at Oxford Brookes University. Alan's teaching and research interests include all aspects of design, materials, engineering, joint technology, automotive engineering, and sustainability. He has expertise in automotive design, low carbon vehicles, and life cycle assessment. And notably, Alan led the research for BMW's Mini E project in 2009 to 2011, and served on the board of directors for the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership 2014 to 2016. Alan joined Oxford Brooks, uh, as it was at the time uh, Oxford Pollen Technic, in 1987, and he has been the investigator, co-investigator for over £10 million worth of research and consultancy, produced over 130 publications in the fields of adhesives, composites, sealants, materials technology, and sustainable engineering, including authorship and co-authorship of books, book chapters, and industry guides. Very fortunately for us tonight, Alan is going to muster all these skills and interests into a presentation on personal mobility, presenting us with challenges along the way. Professor Hutchinson will note that global reliance on motorized transport has led to our current prosperity and economic growth, and that societies now depend on reliable and affordable transport systems, but the challenges of air quality and climate change, energy sources, and congestion have grown and pose major challenges to our mobility and electrification is not the answer many may think it to be. So what is going to determine how and how much we move ourselves about in the future? Professor Hutchinson, we're all ears, but just before we go to the presentation, may I suggest to uh, our audience that they go on to speak of you and that if you'd like to ask a question of Professor Hutchinson, please type it into the chat system. Ian Salisbury, our program group coordinator, will be assembling the questions for the Q&A, which we'll have at the end of Alan's talk. Alan has very kindly agreed to, to do this. And please note that we will be recording this event for showing later on our website. Uh, with that, Alan, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Ian, for that very kind introduction. Um, the expectation levels have gone sky high. Okay, so good evening to everybody and thank you very much for attending this talk today, um, or this evening. So the future of personal mobility. And just before I really get into the meat of that, I'm taking the liberty of just having a little bit of an advert for Oxford Brooks um, to say kind of where I work and something about the School of uh, engineering, computing and mathematics. The Department of Engineering, where I work, basically offers degrees in mechanical, automotive and motorsport. And we're pretty good at motorsport. We're, of course, situated in Motorsport Valley. Um, our team did exceptionally well in both 2018 and in 2019. Whereas this year, of course, it was something of a virtual event because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But the bottom of the picture just really hints at why motorsport can be useful to solve all sorts of issues that face the society. First of all, overcoming technical complexity. And secondly, something about the sort of managerial and logistical challenge of bringing together a solution. In this case, it's a solution how to go fast. And you might wonder what motorsport has got to do with personal mobility and really with being sustainable. And the reason that it's got a lot to do with it is that motorsport vehicles are very efficient. They have to be very efficient to go fast. And efficiency is a bit like a coin with two sides. One side of the coin is called performance for motorsport. The other side of the coin is called economy for mainstream vehicles. So if we understand everything that we can for motorsport and then just apply it to economy, then 
we do have indeed efficient and economical motor vehicles. And today's cars, lorries, buses, and so on are incredibly more economical than they ever were in the past. But we're going to dig into that a little bit more. So I really wanted to start perhaps with some questions and um, ask you to think about how far you think you traveled in 2019, how far you're likely to have traveled in your lifetime and how far, or rather how you're going to do it for the rest of your lifetime. And these are important questions actually. In 2019, I reckon that I traveled about 30,000 miles on commuting, on business, on holidays. And if I multiplied that by my lifetime, that would be sort of one and a half million miles. And frankly, I've got no idea how much oil I used. All I know is that it was an awful lot. That's just for me. If I multiply me by the global population, you can understand that we're talking about the use and burning of enormous amounts of oil. Um, and the emissions associated with that. Now, inadvertently, I showed uh, our um, Prime Minister, who's clearly a pioneer of uh, personal mobility here. You might remember this picture from some years ago. It's on a zip wire. Um, but personal mobility, I'm trying to <coughs> keep tonight on the ground. Um, and kind of go back to a bit of history. I think history, you know, we can learn a lot from. <clears throat> and we basically, human beings went from walking um, to using horses. If you had some money and we were still in the sort of Middle Ages walking, you might be able to find somebody to carry you around if you had a lot of money. Um, otherwise, people used horses to travel greater distances and you could hook of course a horse up to some sort of carriage and you could presumably ride around in some comfort and that was good until about 1900 or so this says handsome cab in london 19, 1895 okay 1895 outside westminster um and then a major disruptive change took place. So this is New York, left-hand side, 1900, right-hand side, 1913. So in 1900, horse-drawn carriages, and in the picture, circled in red, is one motorized vehicle. There was lots of congestion. This is um, Fifth Avenue. Uh, for interest, Trump Tower, as it is today, is only sort of round about there towards the back of the picture. I think this is taken looking south from Central Park. But one vehicle, roll forward only 13 years, same street, there's now one horse-drawn cab, the rest of these are motorised. And we would see the same thing in London, 1900, all buses and indeed the trams, they were horse-drawn trams, moved to 1914, just because these are convenient pictures from the TFL, and it's all motorised. So why the massive change? Well, the horse had a major emissions problem. The streets were piled high with uh, horse manure and it had become a challenge which needed to be overcome by a change in the engines for the, the vehicle. So from horse to vehicle. And to a certain extent, we might be seeing this again now. We've got a disruption with the global pandemic. Bus travel has reduced by at least 50% all over the place. Um, the initial alternatives, of course, are cars, motorbikes, mopeds, bicycles, walking, because these allow for social distances. Um, but these also mostly require a fair amount of space, uh, fairly expensive options, and there's a general loss of flexibility in the sense you've got to have one of these uh, modes of transport and then you've got to park it somewhere and the security and so on and so forth. You can't just sort of hop on, hop off a bus. 
and it requires a fair amount of material and energy resources to make a car or a motorbike and so on. So that begs the question, what are the right solutions for light urban transport in the future? Um, no doubt, like you, uh, I am receiving a lot of uh, online delivery services. They normally come in a van, which is bringing a small parcel in a large van. That's not the right solution in terms of urban mobility. Um, so in terms of urban mobility, we've got the transport of goods and we've also got the transport of people. But I do think that right now, you know, some of us are sitting at home, we've got two cars in the drive, one of them hasn't really gone anywhere much since March, um, the other one's not going far. Does it matter? Not particularly. So it's making me rethink why on earth we've got two vehicles at all, we could do with one. However, there are bigger drivers at hand and we need to really understand the problem with the internal combustion engine and indeed the problem with transport in general. So if we look at the blue line here, this is global population and notice how it was bumbling along and eventually got to about 2 billion around about 1950-ish and then I was born somewhere here. And in my lifetime, we've now got up to about 7.8. So the global population has trebled just in my lifetime. I'm not that old. I know I'm old, but and I'm not responsible either, by the way, for the increase in global population. The thing is, with healthcare and everything else, the human race has been incredibly successful at uh, reproducing and populating the, the Earth. The vast majority of this population is in the developing countries and the purple dotted line along the bottom is the population of the so-called industrialized countries, maybe 30 of them, staying round about the 1 billion mark. So the, the other uh, mainly 8 billion people are in developing countries and naturally people have aspirations. So. We're all consumers, we exploit resources, we buy stuff, we move around, and the world's population is increasingly city-based. So we suddenly get congestion in urban areas. And whether or not we have congestion, it's all using enormous amounts of energy to move ourselves and to move stuff. This generates emissions and creates both local and international uh, air quality issues. So um, urban mobility is a big challenge. Now, some people have estimated that if you took a typical city like Oxford, about 20% of the traffic that you see is simply driving around looking for parking space. Ironically, it's reckoned that another 20% of the city traffic is accessing, accessing um, healthcare services, people going to the GP, going to the hospital, and so on. And maybe they're even going there to um, consult about respiratory related problems, how ironic that might be. So what's the responsible? Well, transport is about 25% of all world energy consumption. And this orange line, which is the global energy consumption, there's some weird units here, um, quadrillion BTUs per year, if you're interested. Um, it's just going up and up and up. It's insatiable. And of course, it tends to have mirrored the population to a certain extent. But at least a quarter is just related to transport. It's 27% in the UK. So, and what is that um, transport fueled by? Well, fossil fuel, oil, a bit of gas. Um, basically, the emissions from burning fossil fuel are slowly killing us. It's a little bit like um, passive smoking. So 
it's not the use of energy per se that's the problem. It's the emissions associated with using that energy that's the problem. And so I really need to try to convince you this evening that our attitude towards energy has really got to change. Now, we all know that energy is extremely accessible, especially electric energy, which is plug something into a socket in the wall. But we need to get it from a greener source. And this is, I would suggest, almost becoming something of a moral obligation. There are many commentators discussing the problem. Indeed, they've been talking about it since at least 1970. Um, one of the more recent people is Jeremy Leggett. He has this blog. He used to be the CEO of Solar Century. And very interesting guy, he's just sold that company, but one of the things that they did was to produce solar powered lights for developing countries rather than people using kerosene, um, which not only caused a lot of pollution, but also was extremely bad in terms of inhaling the fumes from it. But he's written all sorts of stuff and he's followed very closely all of the climate change discussions and negotiations. Um, we know our young people have taken to the streets. Uh, that was not that long ago now, um, in 2019. That's perhaps my favourite here. Don't be a fossil fool. Um, but some of the challenges that we're facing really are huge. And it's really human population drives activity, drives the use of resources. And if we just took a city like Delhi, um, the population has nearly doubled in 20 years, gone from 16.8 million. And most of the transport is in two wheeled motorized vehicles, i.e. scooters. Um, and they have internal combustion engines burning petrol. So energy makes the world go round. And as it goes round, it's dragging this sort of great plume of emissions with it. Um, now, some people have been monitoring what's going on up in the sky um, as a result of all of this. So the, the key thing really to say is that the effect of our insatiable desire for energy and energy used, not just heating and everything else, but in transport has meant that from the traditional biofuels and the sort of greeny thing at the bottom of the screen, Coal then started to be used in great quantities from about 1850 onwards, and then crude oil, and then gas, and then up here, we've basically got some of the renewables plus some nuclear. So that's the scale of this sort of global primary energy consumption. This stuff has to be, you know, dug out of the ground, and it takes a lot of energy to get it out in the first place. Now we can measure what's going on in the atmosphere and there's a man called um, Ralph Keeling who's been sitting at the top of uh, Mauna Loa, perhaps not physically sitting at the top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii, monitoring atmospheric CO2 levels for 56 years. Nice job if you can get it. And since he's been there, he's plotted this graph and it goes up and down seasonally, but we're over 400 parts per million now. And this is well in excess of anything that historical ice cores can show us used to happen. So whilst our planet needs a blanket of gases around it to protect us from the worst effects of the sun and to give us a stable climate, because it would be very cold if we didn't have those gases. If we have too many of those gases, we then add to the natural greenhouse gases, the man-made greenhouse gases. And that's what's been happening with burning a fossil fuel, making things a bit warmer. This is what we call the man-made global warming. And these CO2 measurements are worrying because if we don't do anything about this, this number here would be 700 by the end of this century. And that would be kind of quite catastrophic. The 2050 Climate Change Act actually requires us to go back to levels of CO2 last seen hundreds of years ago. So that's actually going to be pretty difficult to achieve, but at least we can get relatively close to it. 
Now, the focus of many governments globally was to think, well, if we talk about CO2, public don't really get it. You can't see it. You can't smell it. Um, we need to focus on local air quality because people get that. And we've seen various headlines in some of the uh, newspapers, and those are some of them going back a year or so. Um, and we've seen some realistic estimates of um, this idea that the atmospheric pollution, particularly in urban areas, is very much like passive smoking. So we can't shut our um, eyes to this. We can't be ostrich. We've got to think, OK, let's own up to this. Let's think about what we can really do, because globally we're told about five million premature deaths per year. OK, so these are really premature deaths. It's not that 50,000 people sort of fall over, but these are people who are perhaps dying earlier than they need to because of respiratory issues. Now, we reckon that a civilised society requires mobility. Um, and it allows us to do lots of fantastic things to get to work, access healthcare, and so on and so on. But we've got air quality, we've got climate change, we've got to think about where all that energy is coming from. And also in cities, we need to think about congestion. Um, that's um, just outside Los Angeles. The American approach to this is when congestion appears let's just build a few more carriageways and then individuals get into a vehicle get in there it doesn't help <laughs> this tailback just goes on for miles and miles and miles it's just ridiculous so we need to think of different solutions and you know we've got to have better public transport um again looking at some of these graphs this is from the um Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, greenhouse gas emissions from transport, they just keep rising at about 6% per year. Now the graph stops here at 2010, but um, basically it just keeps going up because there's more of us, we're using more land transport. And by the way, all the blue here is just road transport. You might have thought that, I don't know, aviation was the naughty one. Well, that's the orange bit and the dark green. So that's global aviation. This is road use. The railway industry is only a few percent. It's road transport that's the problem. And manufacturers of vehicles have actually done very well over the years. And, you know, our cars are basically mini computers. Um, in order to very, very carefully mix and meter the air fuel that's going through the internal combustion engine. But then the manufacturers found clever ways of um, slightly getting around <laughs> some of the emissions regulations and making their cars look a little bit greener than they really were. Volkswagen was the first one to be trapped by the uh, Americans, but then several others including Mitsubishi put their hands up and said yeah we did something similar as well we fiddled the software inside the uh, the engine and uh, yeah okay fair cop the tailpipe emissions are higher than we claimed they were sadly this is not really helping but all of the technology was thrown at the computer controlled engine emissions regulation part of it. And ultimately, we've got to stand back and think, well, you know, it's the car that's the problem. Now, the first step in this was for people to say, well, what about going electric then? You know, we've heard that electric is greener and cleaner. There's no tailpipe emissions. But I'm sure you know that uh, it does not help if we just plug an electric vehicle into an electricity grid 
which in itself is quite dirty and fueled by fossil fuel. So, for example, if we were in India and we had an electric car, it would actually be worse than having a petrol car. Maybe not in terms of local air quality, but definitely in terms of overall emissions, simply because the Indian grid is like 95% coal. It's just ridiculous. The whole world is trying to phase out the burning of coal completely. UK maybe burns as part of the grid mix less than 2% in a year, and by next year it will be zero. So we've phased right down um, from historically very high levels, and other countries are, you know, desperately trying to catch up with what we've done. So First of all, the question is, if we're going to have cars, is electric car the right thing to do? Well, as Ian very uh, kindly said in the uh, introduction, um, I was involved with the uh, Mini E project when it was uh, started in 2009. BMW approached Oxford Brooks and we were absolutely delighted to be chosen as their research partner to monitor the energy used by those vehicles and even more pleasing is perhaps that the uh, brand new proper electric minis um, are now available for uh, purchase as in uh, I think it was March this year you could start to um, uh, buy them. Um, in between this we had the BMW i3 and basically the information from the Mini trials informed the development of this, and in turn, that informed development of sort of re-engineering of Mini Coopers here, and there's something like three or four fully electric and semi-electric BMW models coming out in the next year. So this was really the starting point as part of a, a global initiative that they took. Um, it's not the only thing that you can do. And in fact, of course, electric vehicles are not new. If we go back to those horse-drawn cabs in America, or indeed anywhere else, but these are in America, um, before we got to fossil fueled vehicles, we had electric cars. We had, we had lead acid battery cars. And as Thomas Edison said, electricity is the thing. There's no wearing and grinding gears and lots of awkward levers and fiddling about with air fuel mixtures and stuff. Um, the problem, and actually, by the way, this is an electric charging point. <laughs> Here's a wire coming out of the shed going into the back here where there's some batteries. Um, but the vehicles had a range problem. They just didn't go far. And so the beauty of the an internal combustion engineers that they gave people far greater distances. And so that eventually won the battle going back over a hundred years. Um, and then perhaps more recently, we've seen some uh, fairly well-known couples get married. And uh, I don't know whether anyone was saw the wedding, but you might have noticed the number plate on that electrified E-type, and this is a special conversion number plate was 19th of May 2018. So that's actually their wedding day was the number plate. Um, and these things are kind of quite good in the sense that a celebrity or well-known person is seen in an electric vehicle. And that gets people quite interested in the whole sort of story. However, let's get back to the story. The electric vehicle, is it sensible at all? Well, Vehicles use energy. Um, all vehicles use energy. The graph here is showing energy consumption versus vehicle weight in kilograms. So 1,000 kilograms is one tonne, 2,000 kilograms is two tonnes. And energy consumption simply goes up with weight. This is for petrol, this is for diesel. It's the same story. The heavier the vehicle, the more energy it uses. That's uh, very simple. Now, if we're using petrol or diesel, then we know there are a lot of emissions associated with that. 
and that's basically the problem. Um, but the, the problem with this sort of weight issue is that um, one person in a car is actually moving one and a half tons of vehicle just to get themselves from A to B. In other words, they're using about, or trying to move about 20 times their own body weight. And that takes energy. If one person goes on a double decker bus, the bus weighs 12 tons before you go anywhere, put one person on it, it weighs just over 12 tons. It uses a lot of energy. They do about six or seven MPG. So weight is a problem in itself. And it doesn't matter whether it's got a petrol engine or a diesel engine or an electric engine. Here's the electrical energy in kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers versus weight. Here's a little pedelec. Here's a large Tesla and some small electric vehicles in between. And it's the same story. The heavier it is, the more energy it uses. The important thing here, however, is although an electric vehicle and a petrol car will use about the same amount of energy, the emissions associated with that form of energy are very different. So we know what sort of emissions we get from petrol and diesel. But with the electric stuff, the emissions are at the power station, they're not with the vehicle. And it turns out they're about four times less for the a typical electric vehicle. So that's the beauty, same amount of energy, but the emissions are about four times less. And you know, future urban mobility could involve far greater numbers of small vehicles, for example. At the moment with our electric vehicles, we've got a big issue with batteries. We need something like 20 times the equivalent mass of a battery compared to the mass of petrol. So to get from, say, here to uh, Edinburgh might um, take you 20 or 30, uh, maybe more, maybe even 40 kilograms of uh, liquid fuel. And you'd need 20 times that in terms of battery to do the same sort of thing. So there is a significant weight penalty. And so a, an electric vehicle with a large battery is not really very clever. Um, OK. The beauty, going back to this picture of the sort of little pedelec and scooter, is that these are using tiny amounts of energy, which could maybe be obtained directly from a solar panel or something, and you wouldn't even need to plug into the grid. Um, and I think the real beauty of the electric bike is that, you know, two of the bad things about cycling are going up hills and trying to cycle into the wind. With uh, electrically assisted bike, those two drawbacks disappear and you don't need to wear the Lycra. Although you might enjoy wearing the Lycra, Lycra that's up to you. It's a personal choice. Um, now, when we kind of consider this in the round, we say, well, what are the whole life emissions or whole life considerations involved with making, using and disposing of a typical vehicle? And we start off with digging stuff out of the ground, the natural resources that takes energy and there's waste associated with that. Then we process it, we make it into metal sheets and panels, then we stamp it into parts, then we make the vehicle. At every step, this is using energy. At every step, it's creating waste. Then we use it. And then after 13, 14, 16 years, whatever, we dispose of it. And it'd be nice to recover some of the components. Again, that uses energy. And so we're just using, 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 using energy. And despite all that, the use phase bit, the burning of the fuel, is probably about 85% of all of the energy that goes into the use and production of a motor car. 85% is just burning the fuel. That is the fundamental problem. But the problems are not over with electric vehicles because when we put together an electric car, it's got full of batteries, maybe two, three, four hundred kilos of battery all in the floor pan, nice and low down, a bit like a motorsport vehicle, very low center of gravity, it goes around corners beautifully. 
but are we designing these battery packs properly at the moment to help recycling end of life? Well, just beginning to. And that's a little bit sad. Um, but at least we are approaching the problem now before it gets too late and before we have millions of battery packs and we don't know what to do with them because actually we want the materials in those batteries because they contain scarce resources. So vehicle design must consider the end of life. I'm pleased to say we're involved with a very big Faraday Institution project which is uh, looking at recycling of batteries. Um, so the, the last thing that I want to mention is, well, you know, is that grid green? And the answer is, it's very, very green now compared to what it was, and it's getting greener all the time. In fact, for the UK, a tremendous success story. In 2019, we did the sums very carefully. Our grid mix was about 50% fossil well, non-renewables, we would call that, fossil fuel and nuclear. This is non-renewable energy and 50% renewable energy, biomass, biogas, hydro, wind and solar. Look, a quarter of all of our energy in 2019 came from wind. 2035 in the national grids two degree scenario, we're looking at 58% of the energy coming from wind, 9% from solar. We don't have any more mountains to introduce into the landscape, so it's still going to be 2% all from Scotland. And we're easing back on the um, biomass because some of this is just wood chips imported from Canada, which is very silly. But nevertheless, we're talking at the moment 50-50. If we looked in sort of 2012 or when we started that mini project, this was probably about 75 and this was 25. So in the space of only six or seven years, the national grid has improved enormously. And that means that electric vehicles make a lot of sense. And some of our student work shows this. This is for um, a Volkswagen Golf, is uh, Golf diesel. And these are the, these are the lifetime emissions. That's who that says kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per year, actually. OK, so per year for an average mileage. Um, and, you know, the internal combustion engine is as good as it's going to get, really. There's no more investment going into that now, basically, because all the manufacturers are turning to electric. So you've still got 1,200 kilograms of CO2 per year. If we look at electric, we're looking here at, say, 300 kilograms of CO2 related to the burning of the um, well, the grid mix, basically, plus the vehicle construction. So it's a quarter. 2017, 2017, e-golf, diesel golf. OK, this is emissions. It's amazingly important. So massive changes. In fact, I think this summer in the UK, we had a couple of days when we were the grid was running on 100% renewable energy or almost 100% for two or three days. Um, but anyway, this is a very big success. Now, the way this sort of is going to come together in the future is kind of quite interesting. The traditional sectors used to be power generation and transport, both using vast amounts of energy. And we had our electricity grid, a little bit of storage, mostly in the stored hydroelectric um, power schemes and transport driven by liquid fuel. But with the wholesale electrification of transport, all these things are coming together and the new normal will start to look like this, integrated sectors where Electric transport needs the energy from the grid and the energy storage needs to be increased because there's a greater and greater amount of renewable energy, which is intermittent in nature and therefore we've got to store more than we do now. So that's why this bubble here is larger than that bubble there. 
Um, and a lot of this could be by batteries. And you might think, ooh, not more batteries, but those batteries could be inside the electric vehicles. We're looking at leveling out the grid demand through the mobile storage capacity in the vehicles through what's called vehicle to grid technology. And it's a very, very exciting thing. So this will be the new normal starting now. Um, and the energy storage sector is amazing in the sense that it's developing very fast. There will be some big static stores as well and battery or hydrogen are the two front runners. But um, vehicle storage is also gonna be incredibly important in the future. It's gonna be complicated, but it's all gonna work through apps. Now it'd be great if we could have enough sunshine to um, charge up all of our vehicles and maybe we will, maybe we won't. Um, but this is abroad and it is possible to have some pretty large solar canopies and get some direct charging, you know, that's great stuff. We've got an increasing selection of um, potential vehicles to buy and that's uh, good. Um, we could also be sensible and go smaller and well, these are uh, electrically driven. These are th small city three-wheeler things. These are pedelecs. This is a Norwegian pod, a four-wheel pedelec. That's a three-wheel um, device. And if uh, I'm sure there's people on the call who are old enough to remember Sir Clive Sinclair's C5, which had a, a Hoover motor in it. Um, well, his grandson is Grant Sinclair, and he's launched this thing called the ISIS, which sounds like it might come from the Oxfordshire area. And it's basically a covered version of the same sort of thing. So there are lots of ideas around this at the moment being developed for urban mobility. They take up less space. They use hardly any energy, got uh, covering from the weather. And these things down here anyway are sort of pretty nippy. That's a Toyota. So lots of examples for the future. Um, the urban landscape could look very different because if we don't stuff the roads for the vehicles, then we can actually have slightly fewer roads or narrower roads, have more shared um, types of vehicle autonomous vehicles. You know, there are lots of different ideas which are being discussed at the moment, but a future urban landscape with suitable provision for different forms of a vehicle for people with all sorts of mobility requirements is a real prospect. And really the only solution that uh, can be used to deal with some of the massive urban congestion that uh, can be seen if we look at Tokyo, for instance, the most populous city on earth. You know, they've had to embrace a lot of ideas like this. Um, there's even more wacky stuff going on, personal rapid transport systems. You can see a small example in the Heathrow Terminal 5 business car park, but there are whole cities which have got these sorts of things where you say, well, if there's no more space at ground level, Let's put the stuff up in the air and then we can go over all the roads and not get in the way of anybody. That's great. Um, this is the sort of thing that you'd see at Birmingham from um, New Street to the airport. It's a rather a simple solution, but it, it works and it doesn't get in the way of the roads. So, you know, it's an alternative. And putting things up in the air is a lot cheaper than digging a tunnel and putting them underground. Then we've got Elon Musk and his ideas of a hyperloop. If you want to travel at 800 miles an hour between San Francisco and Los Angeles, get sort of sucked along one of these tubes like the supermarkets used to do when uh, the people on the tills used to put money up a sort of suction tube. Similar idea, but a lot more sophisticated and using basically a sort of form of magnetic levitation. Um, there are some interesting trials going on with this idea at the moment. Perhaps more locally, Oxford. 
and Mobox. The um, Mobox initiative started many years ago. Some of us have been involved with it, looking at anything from journey planners to smart apps to different ways buses can be used, uh, park and cycle schemes, lots of uh, different things. So the, the whole thing about reducing congestion and using less energy is basically to encourage more walking and cycling, of course, more journeys by public transport once we've all got a, a vaccine against this uh, COVID-19, uh, more intelligent and optimised transport systems, ways of reducing congestion with fewer, more efficient vehicles. So we're thinking far more about a, a usership model rather than an ownership model. Um, you know, do we really need to own a vehicle or can we just happily share things a bit like um, renting out our vehicles because the average car is only used by the owner for sort of three or four percent of the time. So it's a bit like Airbnb your car or something. So maybe we could all have some sort of monthly mobility card and uh, like an Oyster card. But for city dwellers, sort of go anywhere, access any form of transport for a monthly tariff, a bit like your mobile phone. Lots of ideas for cities, large and small. Um, but none of this happens without regulation. So we need both local and national government policies to, to do this. It's basically a sticks and carrots approach, really. You know, the sticks are always taxes and charges like the T charge in London. Um, we get rid of the parking just to make it a nuisance, one way systems and so on. But then the carrots can be useful if you've got better public transport, um, better cycle paths. You know, it's an, an incredible fact the Netherlands has spent at least 20 times more on cycling infrastructure than the UK since the 1970s. And I think I'm right in saying it's kind of like 20 times more per year than the UK since the 1970s. In other words, over a 50 year period, that's a thousand times more in cycling. No wonder the cycle routes in uh, the Netherlands are so beautiful <laughs> and desirable. So we've got to encourage people to think differently, to act differently, to embrace a new sort of electric future. Um, one of the coming back to motorsport at the beginning, the Formula E seven, seventh season starts in January, apparently in Chile. Um, and for the first time, we've got something like seven major vehicle companies, so called OEMs, Original Equipment Manufacturers, participating. That tells you where the future is going. They are using Formula E as a demonstrator for their electric vehicle products, motors, batteries, battery management system, and smart devices to control it all. You don't see so many original manufacturers involved with Formula One anymore. So Formula E is, a, is far more relevant to mainstream motoring than Formula One. Um, but you know, we need to not just encourage that, but encourage these other ways of getting around. And that means a modal shift, getting out of the car and doing something else. But modal shift, again, means different things to different people. That uh, is a modal shift, maybe, at least for the dog, but not the owner. Um, so, you know, how can we get personal mobility in the future? to work for us all without burning so much fossil fuel. Well, a green electricity grid coupled with electric transport, that's clearly a major solution. And the second major solution is reducing congestion through usership rather than ownership and perhaps future autonomous vehicles. So back to the questions at the very beginning, how far are you likely to travel in the rest of your lifetime? How are you going to do it without burning so much fossil fuel? Has the pandemic made you rethink your personal mobility requirements? And indeed, do you need to own a car at all? 
So thank you for listening. This picture is deliberately of both the BMW i3 and Westminster. Um, and Westminster is in the background. It's deliberate because government policy is crucial to really push a change. Now, at this point, I'm going to hand back to our chairman, but we have got quite an amusing video to see as well. Um, and I can perhaps go back to Ian and ask him whether that's something that would be welcomed at this point or not. Let me do a couple of questions first, Alan, and then maybe you could. Yeah. Video. Um, sure. We've had some questions come in while you've been talking. Uh, thank you very much, first for, for your talk. It was um, really illuminating, and uh, the, the figures in terms of the reduction in emissions for cars when the grid changes as well is, is really staggering. I thought. Yeah. So some of the questions that have come in. So Hugh Lee's asked a couple. So Hugh has asked. Um, he said that he, he understands an electric vehicle powered by electricity generated solely from coal has lower CO2 emissions than a petrol car because of the higher efficiency of the electric motor. Is that right? An electric motor is efficient compared to an ICE engine. Yes, I mean, the electric vehicle efficiency is sort of 80, 85 percent. The best ICE vehicles may be 25 to 30 percent efficient. So there is that difference to start with. Um, but I think the beginning of your question was something about a coal fired. So so I, th I think it's the idea that if it's uh, even if it's generated from coal, the electricity, that the fact that the, the electric motor is so efficient, that sort of outweighs the, the coal use. <laughs> Well, yes, I suppose in principle, but the international movement is to stop burning coal because the emissions associated with coal are so huge. And in fact, the energy return on the amount of energy invested in sort of digging coal out of the ground and transporting it and building a power station and burning it, all of that stuff means that the overall efficiency of burning coal is absolutely rubbish. Um, we, in sustainability and life cycle thinking, we talk about um, the energy return on the energy invested. So how much energy do you need to put into a system in order to get energy out of that system? And coal is something like three. Wind energy is something like 25. <laughs> There's just no comparison. Coal is horribly inefficient at all stages in the process. Yeah. So it's not just the burning of it, but actually the mining extraction. And that's even before you start thinking about the safety problems and the miner's lung and all that sort of caper. Yeah. OK, um, some other questions. So um, John Broad asks about uh, e-bicycles and he's saying, do you agree that it's actually a small motorcycle and as such? And as such, motorcycles are part of the solution for longer distance personal transport by reducing congestion and in the electric form, reducing pollution. Yes, a, a pedelec is, I suppose, like a small scooter. However, it does use a lot less energy because the cyclist is still doing some work. It's a, so it, the electric motor in a, a pedelec is very small. The battery is very small and it's just assisting the rider. It's not, it, you can't use a pedelec and not actually move your legs around. Um, the, at least not for something that is regulated in Europe. You've actually got to do some cycling and you can normally choose the level of assistance that you want to have. So you can have a small amount or a large amount. So you see a steep hill coming, you give yourself a large amount of help on the flat, you can use a very small amount. So you can go a very large distance on a very small amount of energy. And you've still got to do some cycling, but not very much. Now, clearly, there are limits to how far you might want to go. But the idea of the pedelec is that you could happily cycle, let's say, 
five, even 10 miles to work. You're not going to get hot and sweaty um, and you're going to feel quite happy about it, except unless it's perhaps heavy rain or something. Um, the electric bike doesn't stop you from getting wet. But uh, <laughs> the, the thing with a, a motorcycle, which may well be electric, is that it's going to use a lot more energy. And of course, it's going to be a lot more expensive to buy in the first place, whereas a a pedelec is a realistic alternative to either a small car or a small bike or moped to do that sort of five or ten mile distance. Yes. Well, that, Whereas, that's something. I know you can cycle five or ten miles, but that's when you start getting into the sort of um, business of unless you're very young and fit, feeling quite done in by the time you get to work and then wanting to have a shower and all the rest of it. Yeah. So, I mean, Hugh Lee's commenting on that, that the very high proportion of car journeys are for less than a couple of kilometres. And so that ties in exactly to that, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I accept that if you're, this is, you know, applies if you're kind of on your own, if you're taking small children to school or something, and that's obviously a different thing. Hmm. Um, but if it's, you know, so many car journeys are undertaken by one person. Yes. What about um, driverless vehicles? Do you think they have a role to play? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think they've got to be contained within themselves. So if you've got a, an area of a city which is just for autonomous vehicles, that's great. I think we're some years off having autonomous vehicles mixing with vehicles driven by human beings. I think there are a lot of issues, not the least of which are um, insurance issues, because the questions that the insurance companies are grappling with at the moment is, well, who's liable if uh, the autonomous vehicle crashes into a human driven vehicle? Mm. Um, and that's one of the things which is still being sort of thrashed out. So. I think or the other thing about autonomous stuff is that if you have them all <clears throat> together and they're not mixing with other things, then those little autonomous vehicles, and they might be actually quite big, they don't then have to have very heavy um, passive crash structures because they will all have sensors on them which automatically apply the brakes. We drive around in cars these days which have quite a large amount of passive crash structure, what we call a crush structure, so we can crash into a lamppost at, you know, 40 miles an hour and still live to tell the tale, if we're lucky anyway. Um, and the, the problem with small city vehicles is that you don't tend to carry that same amount of passive crash structure. And the idea with the autonomous vehicles is that it'd be great if they didn't have to either, so they could be small and light and they'd all have sensors and they'd automatically stop, whereas you can't guarantee that if you mix it with human driven and autonomous, at least not yet, I don't think. Yeah. People will argue differently, I'm sure. Yes. And, and you concentrate pretty much on electric cars. Do you see there's any role for hydrogen powered and air fuel cells? Hydrogen, hydrogen for large vehicles, yeah, for heavy goods vehicles, long distances. Um, maybe buses we, we see a number of buses now but buses can take the opportunity to charge up all over the place i don't see that a bus needs to be hydrogen we don't yet have a hydrogen infrastructure in the uk although nicola sturgeon has got ideas for scotland to use excess renewable energy to um, use electrolysis and to use the energy to store hydrogen um, at pressure and then release it when it's required to, um, you know, put into the grid or directly into transport applications. Um, but definitely hydrogen for the long distance stuff. Electric vehicles are really good for the sort of stop start motoring for which the internal combustion engine is frankly rubbish. The IC engine is quite good when it's going along at constant speed. As soon as you go from 0 to 30 to 0 to 50 to 0 to 20, they're just crap, basically. <laughs> Even with all the modern engine controls on board, they are just not made to do that. 
yeah. the car the the vehicles are very good at constant speed and anything else they're really not so good at an electric it doesn't matter what speed whether it's stop start in fact it's better at stop starting because you've got regenerative braking as well thank, thank you Alan. Right. um so back to ian green yes thank you very much thank you very much alan for a informative stimulating and entertaining uh, talk i uh, i like the last video uh, there's obviously an emission problem with that mercedes um, <laughs> But I also like the uh, early slides showing the tra how fast transport te technology had transformed in uh, the early part of the 20th century. And uh, but I wonder if we I mean, we may get some kind of transformation as quick as that uh, with, with some of the things that you've talked about this evening. But I wonder if some of the transformations might whether the transformation might not, in fact, basically be slower. Uh, and maybe behavioural in the sense that we organise ourselves better so that we need less vehicular mobility in urban areas at least. We could, for example, I mean I am a spatial planner so I, I, I look at this kind of thing, we could do so much better than we do at the moment in co-locating housing and employment and ensuring ready access to mass and public transport. We don't do that terribly well. An example that we've got right on our doorstep of the Ark is that uh, the Eastern Ark, we're still unsure what the government's position is on an expressway, a major road route, when in fact the Ark could work very well with a rail, and the only road you need is the rail connections into the hubs from the housing areas into the hubs, short distances. Uh, in other words, maybe the demand for personal vehicular mobility could reduce by some sensible spatial planning. It doesn't, that doesn't uh, uh, undermine, you know, the, the power of what you've been uh, talking about this evening. But I think in addition to that, there are some things like that that we can do, which could also be uh, an enormous uh, help. And we don't do it very well. We don't do it very well in England and we don't do it well ac across the world. Um, but all in all, what a what an informative talk. Uh, I've learned so many uh, new things and some of the diagrams have been extremely uh, interesting. And thank you so much indeed for, for presenting. I got a feeling that we will be asking you to come back and talk some more because I got a feeling that there are, there are going to be developments in this field moving along quite quickly and also in the field that I've just talked about, the spatial development field. Well, uh, yeah. Work together, I hope. <laughs> That so would be a good combination. Again. Yeah. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you very much indeed. I very, very Pleasure. much appreciated. Just before closing, can I just uh, let the uh, audience know that we have a talk next week on November the 18th, and it's by a railway historian, uh, Lawrence Waters, who's going to talk about the development of the railway from its opening in 1844 until the present day. And of course, there's some very interesting perspectives there. In, in you know, when we consider what Alan's been talking about today. I mean, the, dis the, the, uh, the, the demolition of the, a lot of the railway system was such a tragedy and it could have helped us a great deal in so many respects. But we're going to be having that talk next week. And I would also just like to say that if anyone who's been enjoying Alan's talk uh, this evening, who's not a member of the Civic Society, please do consider joining. Uh, you can contact me at info at oxcivicsoc.org. UK info at ox civic sock or one word dot org dot UK with that once again thank you Alan really really remarkably good talk thank you so much and thank you all for listening in and asking uh, good questions thank you and thank you. good night okay good night